everyone. You know what time it is. It's Grimm's Comics Corner because it's Halloween Horror Month and we're doing Eerie. Uh, yes, we're doing the classic Eerie comics. We've done Vampirella, now we've got Eerie. I just haven't been able to get my hands on the Creepy Tales stuff yet. Uh, maybe it's on an internet archive somewhere, but I actually bought these from Humble Bundle. Yeah, guys, $18, and you can get all the Eerie collected in PDF. Some of you guys are like, I don't want PDF, you know. Yeah, I understand that, but, uh, you can get, like, a program to convert them yourself, and it's not all that difficult. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Now, keep in mind, these are, like, 1960s stories, so, uh... It's going to be a little maybe outdated, but hey, horror to me is never outdated. Oh, it's in black and white too, just like the Vampirella. So let's get started. Making sure we're recording first. Yeah, we are. Eerie. Artists, Eugene Colon, Jack Davis, Reed Crandall, Steve Ditko, Frank Frazetta. Rocco Mastrosario, not really familiar with him, but I'm sure some of you are. Gray Morrow, Joe Orlando, John Severin, Jay Tacey, Angelo Torres, Alex Toth, Al Williamson, Wallace Wood, Roy Krenkel, Donald Norman, and Dan Atkins. As writers, we have Archie Goodwin, Ron Parker, Carl Wessler, E. Nelson Bridwell, Iando Bender, and Larry Ivey, or Ilvey. I don't know what how that is. And editor is Archie Goodwin. Okay. So we have, of course, all the, you know, the people here. This is just the Volume 1 archives. So it has Eerie 1 through 5. Don't know how many we're going to do. We'll see. Oh, from the editors of Creepy. So it must, must have something to do with the, the Creepy Tales. Well, they said it was a family. Um, you know, Creepy Tales, Vampirella, and uh, Eerie Comics were all considered a, you know, a family of horror back in the day. They did some new stuff, but we'll probably do it later if we do do it at all. Some of the new stuff I don't think it's going to hit as hard. Also, I've been watching some Tales of the Tales from the Crypt, of course, which is based on a lot of these classic books. So, um, if you haven't gotten a chance to look at some of those old Tales from the Crypt, uh, definitely do it. I'm not sure if they're online or not, but I've bought all the uh, box sets and I've ripped them myself, so I watched them on a little thumb drive. But yeah. Okay, so we're not going to go through all this right now, guys, because you guys are here for the horror. And, um, you know, Forrest J. Ackerman, of course. First, we gave you Famous Monsters of Filmland, Monster World, Creepy. And now, in answer to, their, to your pleas, threats, and demands, Warren Publishing presents Eerie. Eerie, first issue from the editors of Creepy. Ooh, look at those. Image of Bluebeard, page 3. Death Plane, page 10. The Invitation, page 16. Bonjour, beasties. Come with me to a turn-of-the-century France who I want you to meet a guy who's a real cut-up, a merry maniac who likes to marry his victims before disposing of them. In fact, you might say he's a spitting image of Bluebeard. Mon Dieu, another one. Gah, he was the bearded man. I should have known from the descriptions in the paper. Several weeks later, two newlyweds approached their isolated home, a stoic old building in the midst of the forest belonging to the groom, a trifle sinister perhaps, but hardly enough to dampen the spirits of a new bride. There it is, Monica, old and empty, but your touch will make it a happy place. I know it will be, Brian. Brian Cerulean was hardly the man girls dream about, but then he was the only suitor who paid Monica more than a passing interest. He's old, and there's a rumor he's been married before, more than once. Idle gossip, he's a gentleman and will make a fine husband. Besides, is there any other man who'd have you? 
Monica knew her mother was right. Her plain face would never attract a more dashing man, so finally she accepted. Oh, Brian, put me down. Nonsense. Would you flaunt a tradition hundreds of years old? At first there was much to do, exploring the old house, cleaning and rearranging, but soon the days began to lag. Getting dark already, he's late again. After only a few weeks, her loneliness becomes the marriage's first crisis. Brian, I'm going crazy alone in this house day after day. We have to live here, Monica. It's my territory. The forestry service provides this house and my salary in exchange for my conservation surveys. As soon as her grievance is made, Brian grows solemn and stays coldly aloof the rest of the evening. The next morning, he acts even more strangely. Be patient in your loneliness, Monica. You will have company soon. Aren't you going to work today? No. I must do something in the guest house. Don't disturb me while I'm there. For days on end and half the nights, he locks himself in the small house. It's the only door she doesn't have a key to. Whatever is he up to? Brian shouldn't be so secretive. To occupy the slow passing hours and days, Monica searches the library for something to pass the time. Nothing on the bottom shelves but technical books. Maybe these old books are fiction. On the highest shelf, pushed back almost as though someone had tried to conceal the book, she finds an ancient, elaborately brown volume. The Legend of Bluebeard! What an awful story! Yet so similar to the reports of that fiend still at large in, par in, in Paris. Shortly after their marriage, Bluebeard presented his young wife, Fatima, with all... I No, I wasn't going to say Fatima. With all the keys to his castle as he prepared to go off on a journey. I leave you run of the entire kingdom. Enter any room of your choosing, save one. Never go near or enter this tower room. This I forbid. But Fatima was a curious girl, and not surprisingly, her footsteps soon led her to the forbidden door. There, she came upon the grisly remains of Bluebeard's former wives and dropped the key in terror. Yee! The key was stained with blood, and no matter how hard she tried, Fatima could not remove the stain. And when Bluebeard returned, he saw the stained key. Oh, excuse, oh, excuse me. And when Bluebeard returned, he saw the stained key, knew what she had done, and condemned her to death. Yeah! Dear God, so similar to Brian. Could he be playing out the story according to legend? Suspecting the worst, Monica makes a systematic search of the house and finds what she's looking for in the dark reaches of the attic. Just as I thought, four different marriage licenses. I'm his fifth wife. And these pictures, all of them young, and he with that thick beard with each marriage, he looks more and more like Bluebeard. I'm being foolish. Brian could never hurt anyone. Wait, it sounds like he's talking to someone. Brian, I've made some lunch. You've been locked up in there for hours. What are you doing that's so important? I told you not to bother me. Get back to the house and leave me alone. But like Fatima of the legend, Monica's curiosity is too great. At the side of the guest house, she finds a partly open window. Terrified, Monica runs back to the house, not wanting to believe what her eyes, her own eyes have just seen. He is, Bluebeard! He is! She cannot sleep for fear of him, but her husband acts perfectly normal. And early the next morning, Brian hitches the horse to the carriage. I'm going into town. When I return, I have a little surprise for you. Just one thing. Stay out of the guest house. Do you understand? Y yes, Brian. Brian needn't have ordered her to not enter the, get ha the guest house. No power on earth could have driven her inside now. I'm next. He's going to kill me too. The hours pass and Monica grows almost hysterical with apprehension of her husband's return. I must protect myself from that monster. It is late when Monica hears the carriage arrive. She tries to hide her fear and revulsion as Brian approaches a smile made more sinister by her knowledge of his intentions. Sorry I'm late, dearest. Are you ready for a surprise? First, I have a surprise for you. Somehow the numb window, excuse me, the numb widow manages to inform the police and bring them back to the scene. I, I had to do it. He's the Bluebeard, the man who committed all those murders in Paris. But, but, madam, surely you knew? The Paris Bluebeard confessed two days ago. He's safely behind bars. Impossible. You have the wrong man. I'll show you. The bodies are here. No, no, no. But there are no bodies, just a little menagerie of forest animals Brian had been planning to surprise her with. Charming company to fill the void of, 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 of excuse me, Charming company to fill the void of idle hours for a lonely girl. Tsk, tsk. 
Poor Monica. At least she won't be lonely where she's going, imagine. She was afraid of losing her head over Bluebeard. Now she'll probably lose it to the guillotine. And you'll lose yours over my next fearful fable. Death Plane. It is World War I, time of foul-smelling foxholes and daredevil sky fighters. I'd give anything to be up there right now. Don't be too sure. You may have the smell of fresh air for a while, but you're just as likely to wind up with a face full of gasoline and oil and smoke. See what I mean? Hey, here comes another one of ours. We'll show that murdering kraut. See? I told you we'd get him. I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean? That plane wasn't one of ours. The report is final, sir. There's an unmarked plane up there, indiscriminately shooting down others from both sides. So far, the toll is seven for the Germans, six for us, and no one seems to bring him down. As soon as that plane is sighted again, I want the entire squadron up there to bring him down. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Heard about the mystery ace up there? Nothing else for the last day and a half. Think everyone's right. I mean, about it being a ghost pilot? Perhaps we'll soon know. There's the signal now. Wee -oo, wee -oo. One by one, the planes taxi into position, each with an identical mission. Death for the unmarked plane. Sir, the Germans have already engaged the plane. Six more were shot down, and the others returned to base. Blast it! What kind of demon are we dealing with? Let's just hope we have better luck. In tight formation, the Allies maneuver into position. For ten minutes, the battle rages, and three Allied planes fall to earth in flames. Then suddenly, the planes are engulfed in clouds, and the battle is forced to halt. For fifteen minutes, the planes circle above the clouds, but the mystery ace has vanished. Disheartened, the remaining members of the squadron head back for their base. Gentlemen, I've been hearing many reports from both sides of the line how bullets seem to have passed right through this plane on countless occasions with no result whatsoever. But despite the evidence, I cannot believe this plane to be of supernatural origin, and neither did the Germans. For this reason, we have agreed upon a two-day aerial truce, during which time both sides are to band together and cooperate in bringing this mutual enemy from the skies. The following morning, an, ar an air armada of unequal proportion sets its sight upon a single unmarked aircraft. The single plane is attacked, but remains always silhouetted against the sun. Two planes fall in flames. Despite the forces against him, it's harder than ever to get a good shot at him, the way he keeps between us and the sun. I... Ah! I've been hit! Can't go down, though. Must get a good look at him. I'll... I'll circle from beneath, and then... His face! It... It... It was my own! Now I know... Now I know... That I am the next to die! And it is my soul who now pilots the mystery plane, never knowing rest. Never. Unless... Unless I can replace it with that of another. Who was the first pilot to fly the mystery plane? Who knows? It never was shot down, you know. It's still up there. And perhaps you'll get a chance to see it someday. Real close. I'm Dr. John Cabore. I received this letter advising me that your village was in need of a doctor's services. It included an invitation to take the lodging here at the Chateau of Baron von Renfield. Now that I have arrived, I find a deserted village and but a shell of a chateau. You must be mistaken, my young friend. The Baron has been dead nearly a century. The village forsaken almost as long. And so we begin the hair raiser I call the invitation. A strange, indeed sinister legend lies behind the decaying walls of this chateau. It began 93 years ago on a moonlit night, much like tonight, when Baron von Renfield's coach was traveling on the narrow road, coming into the southern slum of the village. The hour was late, and the coachman was driving the horses at full gallop to deliver his master to a late rendezvous. Unknown to the driver, a defective wheel was slowly breaking from the axle with each jolt, then with one great jog, the wheel flew off and, miraculously, the Baron escaped injury. With his good right arm, his left had been his left, excuse me, his left had been left useless as a result of a wound received years earlier. He pulled himself out of the overturned coach. Finding himself badly shaken but sound of limb, the Baron surveyed his situation. Peter, dead, poor devil, must collect myself, perhaps some water. What? What do you want? 
That should not be difficult to comprehend. We are vampires in search of blood. It would seem that you have been delivered to satisfy our thirst. No, no, you must not make me your victim. I am Baron von Renfield. I am a man of great influence in Hungary. I have friends, business acquaintances, many people, all bigger, healthier than I. Spare me and I will see that your cups overflow with blood. Not just this night, but four nights. Think four for one. I swear by my family oath. Your proposal is attractive. We will give you until next week at this time for the first. But bear in mind, Baron, breach of trust will lead to horrors you cannot imagine. When once again in the seclusion of his chateau, Baron von Renfield paced away the remainder of the night. His thoughts tore at his fatigued mind, seeking a solution to his plight. Thank God, the sun! It almost eradicated last night. It almost eradicated last night's ghastly encounter. But I know the vampires were no nightmare, nor my vow to them. Wah! I shall give a masquerade. Ball, wine, music, and a very special guest. With feverish fingers, the Baron scrawled out the invitation. He almost felt pain in his dreaded left arm as his mind raced back to that night so many years ago, when he had chanced to come upon a lover's meeting. Eva, my fiancé, was my best friend. There could be no alternative. One of noble blood must seek satisfaction. So it was that Baron von Renfield met Boris Hedra on the dueling grounds. Four, five, six... Thus was delivered the wound that rendered his left arm useless. An envelope with Baron von Renfield's seal. Curious, indeed curious. The ball was held on the night of the Baron's deadline with the vampires. Boris, I'm glad you could come. Frankly, Rennie, my inquiring, mi my inquiring mind would not have allowed me to stay away. Outside the great ballroom, anxious eyes watched in quiet anticipation. You must admit it is a bit curious that you should express a desire to see me again after for, after so many years. We were close friends when we were young. Now we are old. The past is past. It is time we forget our quarrel, Boris. Let us go out on the grounds where we can more easily talk. Splendid! We have many years' conversation to make up for. I have been a lonely man since Eva died last year. I wish she were here now. It bothered her deeply that our friendship ended as it... Ugh! The limp of Boris Hedra was swiftly spirited to a hidden dungeon far beneath the ballroom, where the vampires quickly clustered about him. Looking down at the now conscious man's pulsing throat, the unholy group knew its glistening fangs were about to taste fruits of a patience. The first invitation had been a success. The Baron discovered that revenge made the, com made the compiling of his ungodly lust... A much easier task. Sorry about that. <clears throat> who would be more logical to receive the second invitation to doom than Dr. Kovac, who in one of his drunken stupors had failed to take proper precautions in repairing the Baron's dueling wound. Indeed, his drunken neglect had caused infection to set in and the Baron's left arm to be a lifeless pulp of withered flesh. It is most generous of you, Baron, to invite me. Who? Vampires! Yeah! And when at last the blood feast was completed, the leader of the vampires spoke. You have kept your pledge thus far. We shall expect two more. Hugo, the village blacksmith, was the third to receive an envelope with the Baron von Renfield's seal. It had been Hugo's careless repair of the coach wheel the morning of the crash that had caused the fateful meeting with the vampires. The blacksmith was indeed pleased when he read his invitation to dinner with the Baron to discuss construction of a special coach. This is a great day for me, Baron. Once the word gets around that I am building a coach for Baron von Renfield, my shop will be flooded with new customers. The brawny blacksmith put up a greater struggle than the others, but his efforts were wasted when the vampires had finished their blood feast. One more, Baron von Renfield, and your debt will be paid in full. The next few days were sleepless eons for Baron von Renfield. What am I to do? With the disappearance of three people connected with my chateau, I have no chance of luring anyone else. But I must. The vampires are growing impatient. And then came the knock. Who is there? When he opened the door, his blood froze as he looked upon the thirst-crazed faces. 
spittle running down from their lips, their fangs sparkling in the moonlight. Your invitation. Hugo, Boris, good lord, you too are vampires! Dr. Kabore felt a chill run through his body as he stood fascinated listening to the old man's tale. That, my young friend, is the legend behind the one, this once magnificent chateau. But you left out the ending. What happened to the Baron? Can't you guess? I am Baron von Renfield. Even as the old man spoke, his sinister comrades emerged silently from the hinky shadows, quivering, quivering with anticipation as they closed in on their newly arrived guest. I found that invitations were very effective in obtaining new guests for my friends and for myself. We are so happy you could come. If you believe in vampires, are you bats? Well, my doubting little friends, let's check the facts in Eerie's loathsome lore. As usual, the Greeks had a word for it. Rykolakas in the vampire tradition is oldest excuse me the vampire tradition is oldest in Greece going back to the ancient times when blood sacrifice was a favorite pastime Romans developed the quaint custom of drinking the blood of slain gladiators in the belief that it cured epilepsy and gave greater courage 17th century 17th rather century Hungary produced countless Erzabethery who believed drinking and bathing in the blood of young girls preserved her beauty. Local residents found 650 victims excessive and ended, and ended the Countess's beauty treatments. And the Countess! British vampire John George High, really, favored the blood of elderly widows and disposed of the remains in an acid bath. He was apprehended in 1949 when his ninth victim proved a slow dissolver. Even today... Vampirism affects us, as in our speech with expressions like something I can sink my teeth into and bloodsucker. So when a friend will say so when a friend will say I'll bite, watch it. He actually might. First we gave you famous monsters of film land, Monster World, Creepy. Now, in answer to your pleas, threats and demands, Warren Publishing presents Eerie. March number two. Hmm. We could do another. Welcome to Erie. Don't be afraid. Come on in. What can you lose except <laughs> your mind? As all you frenzied followers of Uncle Creepy's terror tabloid have been forewarned, most of you are already forearmed. I'm Cousin Eerie, your host of horrors. Fiendish fans will find my little chamber of chills wretchedly rendered by the same creepy collection of demon draftsmen and screaming scribes and even more blood curdling. Unk's not as young as he used to be. You're po you poor souls who are nervous newcomers to this world of the weird had best hang on to your hearts and be prepared for the spine tingling thrills lurking on each pulsating page of this collector's edition of the. Eerie. Don't let Fatso fool you. These fairy tales couldn't curdle milk, let alone blood. It may be better than fixing your horror habit with a <laughs> competitor's slimy servings, but when better, when better spines are tingled, it's Uncle Creepy's ghouls gathering of terror tales that will do it. Okay. Ah, Frank Fazette on that cover. Footsteps of Frankenstein. One for de money. Eye of the Beholder. Flame Fiend. Eerie's Monster Gallery. To pay the piper. Vision of Evil and Ahead of the Game. Okay, so we probably won't do this one right now because it's got a lot. And it seems like that would take... It's about 30 pages, right? Give or take. So we're on page... Yeah, it's going to take... No, 30. Yeah, that's about 40 pages. I've only done about 37 so far, so that would take another half an hour. Let's uh, let's end it right on here, guys. and Let me know what you think of these old comics. I know some of you guys aren't into them, but some of you are. 
And if you like these old comics, we'll continue to do them throughout the Halloween Horror Month, that is. Maybe I'll even do a classic Vampirella, right? But I've got way more content to give you guys. Just letting you know that comics are still a thing here. This is the Grim Lord, and I'm out for Grim's Comics Corner, or Spooky Comics Corner, with Eerie.